Planned Parenthood was founded not simply as an organization for limiting the size of families in general, but more particularly to reduce the reproduction of the black population in the United States. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up, y'all? We are checking out some more Thomas Soul, And the reason why is because I'm trying to make sure that more people who look like me find out who this gentleman is because a lot of people do not know. Also, I wanted to say uh, um, shout out to Jacqueline for sending me this book, um, Black Rednecks and White Liberals. I really appreciate that. I heard that this, this story right here is actually from this book. I haven't started on it yet um, because I'm still finishing up my, <laughs> my Jordan Peterson book. <laughs> I have two, and um, but I am going to get on. For everyone else who sent me books, thank you so much. All right, let's get into this and see what happens, man. And share this to as many people as possible because I want many, many, many people who look like me to hear about Thomas Sowell. Yes, I want everybody to hear about Thomas Sowell, but I think it's imperative that people who look like me hear about this gentleman right here. Fanatical nationalism was at the heart of the Nazi creed. To what extent did most Germans share that creed during the Nazi era? Was it a creed going back into history or continuing on past the Second World War? Patriotism has been common to peoples around the world, particularly in wartime, and especially when people have been led to believe that their country has been attacked. There is no reason to doubt the patriotism of the Germans during the Nazi era, but gauging public opinion in a totalitarian state can hardly be done with any precision. The euphoria with which the beginning of the First World War was greeted in Germany was all too common across Europe at the time. What of Germans outside of Germany, and across a wider stretch of history than a few decades of the 20th century? Despite the tenacity with which Germans clung to their but own culture in the farthest reaches of the world, there was no such political loyalty to the German nation or its antecedents. Germans in Russia fought loyally against Germany in the First World War as German-Americans did in both world wars. No one found it noteworthy during the Second World War that so many top American military leaders were of German ancestry, nor was any question of conflicts of national loyalties raised. In Australia, those Lutheran churches that were subsidized from Germany tended to be sympathetic toward Germany, while those subsidized from the United States were not. Yet, once Australia went to war, even the Lutheran churches that had been sympathetic to Germany before now urged their members to fight for Australia and otherwise cooperate with Australian authorities. The Nazis worked hard to infiltrate German organizations in the United States, Brazil, and Australia during the years leading up to World War II, but with only limited success, despite tactics that sometimes included threats of reprisals against family members in Germany if their overseas relatives did not cooperate. Where German minorities had been badly treated, as in Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union, it was a different story. Please excuse me for not saying too much because I am literally, literally just now learning of all, all of this. <laughs> my very first time so if i do have to interject and ask a question or something it will be like not i will be outside of my reactors um zone trying to make sure that i stop the video certain points of time just just for the sake of um youtube to do that thing with ads and whatnot um for this right here completely in the dark um and i'm trying to learn so if I don't say too much, please forgive me. Also, if you like this style of content, please do me a favor and th hit that subscribe button. Also, the notification bell so that next time I do put out some content, you'll be the first to be notified. Thank you. Germans in the Sudeten region of Czechoslovakia helped create the crisis that was resolved at the infamous Munich Conference of 1938, where Britain and France agreed that Nazi Germany should take over that whole region of Czechoslovakia. Later, when the German army invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, Black Sea Germans welcomed them as liberators, as did some non-German wow. minorities. And wow. then, after the Soviet army counterattacked, more than a quarter of a million ethnic Germans followed the Nazi army as it retreated back to Germany. During the post-war Red Army occupation of East Germany, tens of thousands of former Soviet Germans were forced to return to the USSR, though tens of thousands of others used false identities to avoid this fate, and still others avoided it by committing suicide. Wow. During Sheesh. the war, many Germans in the conquered lands, suddenly elevated to privileged positions as members of the master race by the Nazi occupiers, 
collaborated actively, leading to a post-war backlash that led to the expulsion of millions of Germans as mass punishment. I almost feel bad for not sitting here taking notes, man, because he's giving some good information right now. And um, in this one thing, I'm, I'm really going to have a better understanding of the Holocaust once this is done. That's what I'm looking forward to, because um, I hear that that was like one of the most greatest tragedies of, of all time. And, and a lot of black people bring up the Holocaust when, they, when we're talking about reparations. We compare slavery to the Holocaust. And apparently the, um, um, those people were able to get um, some type of monies for what they went through. I suppose that's what's, um, what uh, black people would like to do too. Um, people who are in the fight, I suppose. Okay, get back to it. Respective of individual guilt or innocence. The question here, however, is not the balance of justifiable or reprehensible behavior on the part of Germans in Europe during a period of several years, but the larger historical question of whether the Nazi ideology and its horrifying consequences represented an enduring set of distinctive characteristics of Germans as a people. Those Germans living overseas, in lands where they had no special grievances and were free to express themselves, showed no such loyalty to Germany as a nation, much less to Nazi ideology, as to sustain a conclusion of indelible cultural characteristics favorable to the values of Hitler and the Nazis. The Nazi amalgamation of nation and... That is wild that um, Thomas Sowell studied different nationalities, um, different cultures, different... Um, different walks of life and could tr could translate the information to someone like myself and and almost like um, I'm right there in the room while he's talking about it you know it's 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 pretty cool that he's passing this information down to other people who don't know much about it because it's important that we know that we know about their history you know and the Nazis the Nazi amalgamation of nation and race under totalitarian rule one people, one country, one leader, led to the horror most unforgettably burned into the history of Germany and of Germans, the murder of millions of Jews and others deemed to be of inferior races. Wow. Was this the culmination of long-standing beliefs and actions of the German people, or a monstrous new creation of the Nazis? In Germany, as in other countries, there were people hostile to the Jews on religious, racial, or other grounds, nor were these isolated, anti-Jewish individuals. There were institutions, movements, and political parties hostile to Jews, sometimes bitterly and venomously so. And these included historic figures from Martin Luther to Richard Wagner. But the ultimate question is how all this affected the behavior of the German people as a whole, as compared to other peoples in Europe and elsewhere. Self-aggrandizement and bias against others has been too tragically pervasive throughout human history and among peoples around the world to make it a distinctive characteristic of a particular people or a particular era. However, racism in its modern sense of belief in innate genetic inferiority and superiority of particular races has had a shorter history, dating from the last half of the 19th century when some regarded this doctrine as a logical corollary of Darwin's theory of evolution. I have to point something out. I really have to point something. I really have to point this out. And I know this is probably most, most disrespectful, well, not disrespectful, just point, it might seem pointless to you all. Um, you see Hitler's haircut. Do you see Hitler's haircut? The reason why I'm pointing out his haircut is because, <laughs> wow, this is the haircut that's extremely, extremely popular amongst black men. This is called a temple taper. This is called a temple taper, the exact same haircut. I just find out a little awkward that this haircut is the, it just so happens to be the haircut that a great deal of black men get. No ball. I'm okay. I'm, I know that was just a, a ridiculous point. But I had to point that out. Also, speaking of black men, if I just need like 100 to 150 of you guys to send this bad boy out, um, just to share it amongst your group so that uh, hopefully people who look like me can know exactly who Thomas Sowell is. Because right now, they do not. 
they this is there's, there's so many people out there who look like me that don't know who Thomas Soul is and they need to. They definitely need to. By natural selection. Hostility to Jews, for example, had existed for thousands of years, but anti-Semitism in the strict sense of believing in the biological inferiority of Jews as a Semitic people was one of the offshoots of what was regarded as scientific racism. Wow. This new racism wow. that wrapped itself in the mantle of science was neither peculiar to Germany nor limited in its application to Jews. In the United States, some referred to the immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe as the beaten men of beaten races, who would be incapable of being able to be absorbed into American society. The eugenics movement sought to limit the reproduction of inferior individuals and races so as to prevent the lowering of the national intelligence in future generations. Planned Parenthood was founded not simply as an organization for limiting the size of families in general, but more particularly to reduce the reproduction of the black population in the United States. Wow. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. People need to hear this. People need to, people need to hear this right here, man. It's see, this is going to be all, man, this people need to hear this. Planned Parenthood is held up like one of the greatest things to ever happen to black, uh, um, to, to the black community. And oh my gosh. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. This is something right here. Okay. But more particularly, to reduce the reproduction of the black population in the United States, as Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger herself noted, such ideas were common among intellectuals who considered themselves progressive at the beginning of the 20th wow. century. Ironically, although the logical corollary of this genetic determinism was that national IQs would fall over time, as less successful people with generally lower IQs tended to reproduce at a higher rate than more successful people with higher IQs. Research in the last years of the 20th century showed that scores on IQ tests had in fact risen substantially in more than a dozen nations during the course of a generation or two. The question here, however, is not the validity of genetic determinism, but how widespread and how openly avowed it was during a particular era. Germans were neither exempt from nor unique in their susceptibility to this doctrine. Hitler's racism represented the gutter-level application of an idea discussed in more lofty tones at higher intellectual levels. Racism in our narrow modern sense has been a significant force for a little more than a century, while violent and lethal hatred of other groups goes back thousands of years. There were pogroms against Jews in Europe, and similar mass slaughters of Chinese minorities in Southeast Asia, centuries before most people had ever heard of genetics. What, then, has been the record of Germans in this longer and broader history of intergroup hostility, discrimination, and violence? Comparing Germans with other Europeans for the sake of convenience, it seems clear that whatever differences there were historically tended to show the Germans not as intolerant as most Eastern Europeans, for example, toward the Jews. Jews fleeing from Eastern Europe to Germany constituted about one-fifth of the Jewish population in Germany when Hitler came to power. However tragic that was in the light of later events, it was a very reasonable move in light of the differences between Germany and Eastern Europe at that time. Jews were so widely accepted in Germany that nearly half of all Jewish marriages there between 1921 and 1927 were marriages to people who were not Jews. Wow. German Jews were noted for being far more assimilated to the larger Western society than were Jews from Eastern Europe. And this was true not only in Germany, but in the United States and as far away as Australia. German-American immigrant communities welcomed German Jewish immigrants as members of their Turnverein, singing groups and other cultural organizations. 19th century German Jews living in Chile and Czechoslovakia likewise took part in the general cultural life of German communities in those countries. Y'all ever met somebody so smart? I'm sure every single one of you probably know some. No, that's not true. <laughs> some of you know some people who are just world class intelligent, like Thomas Sowell. This guy is a freaking genius, man. Just the way that he just. I don't know, man. He's. The fact that he would go out there, do all this research, and package it up for us to be able to uh, read it in a way that is understood and 
this this does nothing but give us more respect for other cultures, more understanding, more context. It gives us context. That's what it does. It shows us that even though these people, oh my gosh, were taught to do some some things, they were people. They were real people. So it, I don't know. It gives you that full circle of understanding that a lot of us aren't really ready for. Vakia likewise took part in the general cultural life of German communities in those countries. Jewish views of pre-Hitler Germany were very favorable, not only in Germany itself, but overseas. During the First World War, American Jewish publications were so favorably disposed toward Germany that they were investigated and prosecuted for favoring an enemy nation in wartime, leading to the famous clear and present danger doctrine in favor of free speech by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes in cases involving Jewish writers, Abrams v. United States and Schenck v. United States. Even some Zionists in Palestine returned to Germany during the First World War to fight for the fatherland. Jews were, of course, not the only targets of racial hostility, nor Germany the only place where such hostility was expressed and acted out. What has been the record of Germans with regard to other racial or ethnic groups in other countries and in other times? We have already noted the cosmopolitan tone that Germans sought to maintain in the face of group identity extremism among Latvians and Czechs, though in both cases the Germans eventually decided that they had to defend themselves as Germans. In the Western Hemisphere, the first anti-slavery meeting in North America was held by Germans in 1688, wow. and Germans in Brazil were likewise opposed to slavery there. Get out of here! Get out of here! <laughs> wow, they're opposed to slavery, but everything else is... Wow, okay. In 1688, right. and Germans in Brazil were likewise opposed to slavery there. Yeah. A history of the antebellum South referred to a colony of anti-slavery Germans who settled in Texas, as well as Germans in Virginia who were antagonistic to slavery, and Germans in St. Louis who were strongly anti-slavery. When whites in early 19th century North Carolina voted to deny the franchise to free blacks, this disenfranchisement was opposed by voters in almost all of the western counties of the Piedmont region, where the Germans and the Scotch-Irish were concentrated. While Germans were split on many of the complex issues revolving around race and slavery, no prominent German-American leader was pro-slavery. And, when the Civil War came, the large German population in Missouri was credited with keeping that state in the Union, despite many Confederate sympathizers among other Missourians. As for relations with the indigenous population of the Western Hemisphere, Germans were noted for getting along with the Indians better than other Europeans did though all had clashes with the indigenous peoples at some point or other. Germans in Paraguay likewise treated the indigenous people in a more conciliatory manner than other Europeans had. In Australia, Germans established missions to help the aborigines. As noted in an earlier essay, in the German colonies in East Africa, slave traders were hanged on the spot when they were caught in the act. Wow. The history wow. of pre-Hitler Germans, Sheesh. whether at home or abroad, can readily stand comparison with that of most Europeans, just as the record of Europeans can stand comparison with that of most other races around the world. That is what makes what happened under Hitler and the Nazis even more chilling. If this could happen with Germans, it could happen with any other people. Hold on one second, I just need to read this right here. So these are key facts in this whole Jewish communities of pre-war Germany. It says in 1933, Jews represented less than 1% approximately 500,000 people of the total population of Germany. Sheesh. Oh, my Lord. The majority of Jews in Germany, this is part number two, the majority of Jews in Germany lived in major cities, such as Berlin, uh, Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt and Main, and Hamburg. And Jews participated in many areas of ger um, German life, such as journalism, law, culture, and medicine. Wow. Wow. So they was doing a lot for, for Germany before they started being. Wow. Okay.
There were anti-Semites in Germany, as in other countries, and their words can now be read as alarming warnings in light of our knowledge of what lay ahead. But there was little at the time to serve as a credible warning of such a monstrous and almost inconceivable event as the Holocaust. Even if we confine the question to those Germans living in Germany during the fatal dozen years of the Nazi regime, the issue is whether the Germans of that era, or even those particular Germans whose votes put Hitler in power, were attracted to him for his racist agenda. In elections held from 1871 through 1928, German political parties explicitly devoted to anti-Jewish principles reached a high of 7% of the vote and a low below 1%. Wow. These parties included, but were not limited to, the Nazis. A study of anti-Semitism in Germany concluded, by 1914, the anti-Semitic parties were practically defunct and their press was in ruins. Hitler's speeches during the election campaigns of 1928, 1930, and 1932 made no specific proposals on what he intended to do about Jews. He apparently did not see German public opinion as ready for any of the actions that he would, in fact, later take against the Jews. When the desperation of Germans in the face of severe economic and social crises created by the worldwide Great Depression of the 1930s elevated Hitler from a fanatic in the streets to a dictatorial ruler, the die was cast, fatally. Is there a story behind his mustache? I know, I know, I know. I keep on bringing up the silly stuff, but these are the questions I have. And I'm not just doing it out of, it's not a nervous tick because I, I don't really have um, have the, the best understanding of everything that's being explained right now. I don't learn the same as everybody else. Um, I'm more than likely will have to go back and look at this again in order to really understand. And that's just how I, that's just how I learn. I apologize, guys. Um, but yeah, is there a story behind his, his mustache? Because I noticed that throughout history, he's pretty much the only person that I remember with that mustache like that. That's just blocked off right underneath his nose and very wolfy at that point, but bald everywhere else. So if y'all know anything, please let me know. From that point on, it no longer mattered what most other Germans thought, whether about race or war or anything else. But before then, when voters in Germany had their last free choice, what were Hitler's supporters supporting? What did they know, and when did they know it? A study that attempted to answer these questions concluded, Middle class and other voters did not vote for Hitler because he promised to exterminate European Jewry. Neither did they vote for him because he promised to tear up the Constitution, impose a police state, destroy labor unions, eradicate rival political parties, or cripple the churches. Even Hitler's Mein Kampf did not forecast these events. During the years leading up to the Second World War, Hitler moved against the Jews in orchestrated stages, allowing him to gauge the extent to which German public opinion supported his actions. A Nazi-sponsored boycott of Jewish stores in 1933 failed so badly that it was called off after four days, rather than have it be an ongoing fiasco. Even after five years of anti-Jewish propaganda in Germany, when the Nazis in November 1938 unleashed Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass featuring violence against Jews, their homes, and their businesses, the negative reactions of Germans, including some Nazi party members, led Hitler to proceed against the Jews thereafter with as much secrecy as possible. Even when Jews were rounded up and sent off to concentration camps, there was nothing at that point to indicate the grisly fate awaiting them, and it was a crime punishable by death to reveal the extermination program. Rumors circulated, and some undoubtedly knew more than rumors, but rumors and speculations always abound in wartime. Moreover, even those who were certain of what was happening had no ability to stop it in a totalitarian state, and they and their families could pay with their lives for publicly protesting. Even a prominent German-Jewish leader like Leo Beck said that he did not know about Auschwitz and the systematic killing of Jews until 1943, even though millions of Jews had already been killed by then. Genocide against the Jews was a government program, not the lethal mob violence unleashed against the Jews in earlier pogroms in Eastern Europe or against the Armenians in Turkey during the First World War or against the Igbos in Nigeria in the 1960s, 
or against the Chinese in a number of Southeast Asian countries on a number of occasions over the centuries. Given the fact that Jews had been stripped of legal protections early in the Nazi regime, any of these things might have been done by the German people. Indeed, Hitler tried to represent Kristallnacht as a spontaneous burst of public outrage, rather than as the staged event that it was. Could you imagine, um, I mean, because the great majority of them gentlemen that are standing up there right now, they, they felt like they were doing the right thing for their country or for the person who was their leader at the time. And they all have families. They all, because you know that's how it is. We look out for our families first, and then everything else follows suit. But every single last one of them, they thought that they were on the right side of everything that was going on, regardless of everyone that was being hurt in the process, killed in the process, um, the, the laws that were being made against complete peoples back then all of these gentlemen thought and felt like they were on the right side and you can't tell them anything it was like because you can't deny the fact that they they had families that they were people first when they they bled just like everyone else they cried just like everyone else you know what i mean it just it's it's something man it's it's something i just had to point that out okay but what the German people did not do in these circumstances may be more revealing about their own attitudes. None of this denies that there were anti-Semitic fanatics in Germany, both in the Nazi party and among the German public. It simply makes the dimensions and duration of anti-Semitism among Germans at large subject to question. What must also be noted is that Jews were a very small minority in pre-Hitler Germany never as much as 2% of the population, yep. despite their prominence or even predominance in particular fields, such as medicine, journalism, or banking. The average German had no compelling reason to be thinking about Jews, one way or another, and indications are that most were apathetic about anti-Semitism. That's wild that it was so little of them, but they were still able to go so far and be able to get some of the top-paying jobs and all these other things, careers and whatnot. They just... They just kept going, man. Shout out to them. Both before and during the Nazi era. Nevertheless, the egregious behavior of the Nazis toward the Jews prompted some Germans to come to their aid, even during wartime, when that meant risking death for themselves and their families. Estimates of the number of Jews hidden in Berlin alone during the Second World War run into the thousands. As for post-Hitler Germany... Perhaps the following capsule account from Commentary magazine, published by the American Jewish Committee, is as revealing as any. All told, Germany's voluntary payments for past wrongs amount thus far to more than 55 billion over a period of six decades, and are unparalleled in history. These were not the reparations after the First World War imposed on Germany by the victorious powers, these were reparations voluntarily paid by a democratically elected German government. This did not, of course, mean that all hostility to Jews had been obliterated in Germany. It does suggest that such hostility was not pervasive nor necessarily greater than in other European countries. It is hard even to imagine such reparations being paid to persecuted groups by democratically elected governments in places like Rwanda, Uganda, Fiji, or other countries where minorities have been expelled or slaughtered. You know what I call Thomas Sowell? I call him Mr. Perspective. If you want some perspective, you listen to some Thomas Sowell, you read some Thomas Sowell. He's going to give you some perspective. Because he's going to give you someone else's side in a way that you've never heard in your life. Just to let you know that you're not the only one. Some people have gone through a lot more. But since you're not studied, you wouldn't know. It's okay though. I'll help you out with that information. That's how that's the that's the type of feel I get from Thomas So. That's why it's imperative that if you haven't already, please share this with somebody on Facebook, on somewhere. I don't care where you share it. I just want someone, one of your black friends to be like, yo, or one of their friends who's, you know, familiar with them to be like, yo, who is this guy? Thomas So? Or Thomas Sowell, how I thought it was, or Sowell, Sowell. But 
I want to hear what y'all got to say, man. Thank y'all so much for hanging out with me. Love y'all.